Welcome to Cocos 2D Tutorials, brought to you by Bob Euland. For more information, go to bobuland.com slash cocos2d. This tutorial is called Introduction to Core Data. This is the first tutorial in a series of tutorials about core data. Core data is a fairly difficult subject and in order to learn it, you will have to go through all the four tutorials. Most applications need persistence. Several techniques are available. If your data requirements are light, you can use plain text tiles, property lists or NS coding. If your data requirements are heavy, you can use SQLite database or core data. In this tutorial, we will concentrate on core data, but we will also compare it with SQLite. SQLite has a number of advantages. It is easy to learn and use. The database is a flat file embedded in the app, which means no server is involved. And you don't have to have permissions or bother with passwords. There are external tools you can use to create and retrieve data from the database file. Many existing databases are in SQLite format, so your app can easily read data from them. But from an object-oriented perspective, SQLite does have some limitations. It manipulates scalars, that is primitive types like numbers and text strings and not objects. It does not handle object graphs, which is important as we will see later. Since we are working in an object-oriented environment, we want to manipulate objects. So how do we deal with the fact that SQLite delivers only scalars? The traditional way is to have special methods that convert scalars into objects, and the other way around. This is called Object Relational Mapping, abbreviated ORM. Core data is not an ORM. Instead, it works with objects directly. Here are some characteristics of core data. The main disadvantage is that it is difficult to learn. But there are some advantages. First, it handles objects in an object graph. In fact, it can manage very large graphs of objects by caching in the needed objects as needed. This reduces memory need and improves speed. Since we are using RAM instead of disk, we get improved speed. Since we are caching, we reduce the memory requirement. The object graph makes it possible to traverse that graph giving us a very powerful way to access the data of the objects. But it is also possible to make queries like the SQL does, giving us the best of both worlds. Using core data we get many benefits for free, like support for undo-redo, key-value coding, model view controller support, binding, iCloud sync and so on and that saves the programming time. So even though it is difficult to learn and requires that you already know some basic patterns like key-value coding, it is very powerful and well worth the time investment. Once you learn to use it, you will be able to make powerful applications and you will not want to be without it. Let's now say a little about SQLite vs Core Data. First, learning SQLite will not help you much learning core data. SQLite and core data approach data from very different angles. Core data handles object graphs, not databases. SQLite handles databases, not object graphs. SQLite is disk-oriented, while core data is RAM-oriented. Core Data provides many of services that SQLite doesn't. Core Data uses many new words, and you will likely be overwhelmed the first time you start to learn it. 
Some concepts are similar but not identical to those used in databases. As you know, databases go way back in history. The term database was introduced in the mid-1960s when the hard disks were invented. Before the arrival of hard disks, tape-based systems were used, which meant daily batch processing of the data. But hard disks allowed for interactive access to the data, and that was a revolution. The overall concern was efficiency, so programmers described the database concepts in physical terms. They used terms like files, fields and records. In 1970, a mathematician, Edgar Codd, proposed that the logical and physical aspects of a database be separated. The programmers should not bother to think how the data should be physically stored, and only concern themselves with the logical aspects of the data. He proposed the relational database, which was a purely mathematical construction. In fact, the term relation was taken from its mathematical meaning, as defined by the first-order logic theory and algebra of sets. Relational database systems, as defined by Codd, required much processing resources. It was not until the mid-1980s that computing hardware became powerful enough to make them widely used reality. The corresponding terms that Codd used in his model were relations, attributes and tuples. SQL was initially developed at IBM by Chamberlain and Boyce in the early 1970s. SQL introduced its own vocabulary – table, column and row. In fact, if you read about the databases, you will likely meet a mix of these words for instance, tables containing fields, and similar. Core data was evolved from the next product, Enterprise Object Framework, which was an ORM, Object Relational Mapping, for SQL database engines. Enterprise Objects Framework was developed in mid-1990s, and when Apple bought Next, Part of the Enterprise Objects Framework technology was used to develop Core Data. Core Data was released in 2005 for Mac OS X and in iOS in 2008. Here are similar concepts that are used with Core Data. A persistence object store corresponds to a database. Managed object model corresponds to the tables inside the database. There are two types of properties – attributes and relations. A property corresponds to a column. A managed object corresponds to a row. Let's go back to basics. Here is your app which handles objects. Objects live in RAM. More specifically, in a portion of the RAM called the heap. When you work with core data, you also work with objects in RAM. Now, these objects are a little special, so they are not called simply objects, they are called managed objects. By default, they conform to key value coding. The portion of the RAM where they live is called the managed object context. Here on the left side I have written the name of the corresponding classes NS Managed Object Context and NS Managed Object. The persistent store coordinator can make the managed objects persistent. The corresponding class is called NS Persistent Store Coordinator. When you create the NS Managed Object Context, you must first create the NS Persistent Store Coordinator. 
and tie it to the NS managed object context. And when you create an NS persistent store coordinator, you must tell it the name of the store file and the path to it. Normally, you will keep the store in the application's document folder. Here you can see an example. There is one more thing you need in order to create the persistent store coordinator, and that is the managed object model. This model is normally created with the Apple's Data Model Editor, and you will see it in the resources under a name such as xxx.xcdatamomd. Behind the scenes, Xcode is transforming this into several files, one of them being called something like xxx.momd. The suffix stands for Managed Object Model Description. When you create the Managed Object Model, you must provide the name of this file. So, to summarize, your app will only work with a Managed Object Context. But to create it, you need first to create a persistent coordinator. And to create that, you need to first create the Managed Object Model. And to create that, you need to create the model with the Data Model Editor. Once the context, the coordinator and the model are created, you can start to fill the context with managed objects. These objects will have connections between them, and the result is a dynamic object graph. Observe that the model is created before runtime but that the object graph is created during runtime and can change at any moment. Let's say a word about object graphs. An object graph is a view of an object system at a particular point in time. Whereas Entity Relationship Model details the relationships between classes, the object graph relates their instances. Object-oriented applications contain complex web of interrelated objects. Objects are linked to each other by one object either owning or containing another object, or holding a reference to another object. This web of objects is called an object graph, and represents the state of the application. Here is an image of Data Model Editor, and an example of a model that you can build with it. We have two entities, a department and an employee. Each entity has attributes and relations. Here is the corresponding object graph. Here we see one department and two employees. In reality, there could be dozens of departments and thousands of employees so the corresponding object graph would be much, much larger. Here is one example of how you can access entities and their properties from your code. If you have a pointer to Joe, you can access his salary with joe.salary. You can access his manager's salary by joe.manager.salary. You can access the budget of the department for which Joe's manager works with joe.manager.department.budget. You can access all the people that work for Joe's manager by joe.manager.directreports. The return value of this would be a set. Following the connections in Object Graph is one way to use Core Data. But you can also use it in another way, that is similar to making requests in SQL. Core Data uses the term Fetch Request for this. Here is one example. To make a Fetch Request, you must first tell what kind of entity you are after. If you, for instance, say Employee, and nothing else, it will retrieve all the employees from the store. 
if you want just a part of employees, you specify a predicate that tells what kind of employees you want to single out. In the example here, we are telling that we only want employees whose salaries are higher than $60,000. By default, the retrieved employees are unsorted, but you can ask Core Data to sort the result. In the example here, we are asking the result to be sorted by name in ascending alphabetical order. The classes that deal with fetch requests are NS fetch request and NS predicate. These six classes form the basics of Core Data. Here are some of their key methods. Now that we have the basic theoretical understanding of Core Data, how do we learn to use it in a practical way? That will be explained in the next tutorial. Thank you for watching.